Hi, this is Julian Lennon, and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci. Well, hello, hello, and welcome once again to a program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show that focuses on what's going on in the world of the Beatles newswise. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, best known for my syndicated Beatles program called Every Little Thing, being joined by the man who knows more about what's going on in the world of the Beatles as far as news is concerned, that being Steve Marinucci of Beatles Examiner. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Uh, hello, everyone. On today's show, we have a special guest with us on the phone. In fact, he's calling us from England, and uh, he has just written a brand new book. It's called The Beatles, the BBC Archives. His name is Kevin Howlett, and before we introduce him, I just want to let you know some of the other things that he has done in the past as far as uh, all the projects he has worked on uh, on The Beatles. He's written a couple of other Beatle books, The Beatles at the Beeb, the story of their radio career from 1962 to 65. That book came out in 1982, also a book called The Beatles at the BBC, The Radio Years, 1962 to 1970. That came out in 1996. He co-wrote a book with uh, Mark Lewison. And uh, the name of the book is In My Life, John Lennon Remembered. He's produced uh, a, B a Beatles BBC radio special that aired in 1982, and then another BBC special that I think aired in 1988. And then he wrote the sleeve notes for all 14 of the Beatles uh, of their core catalog albums that were remastered and reissued in 2009, uh, also for Let It Be Naked, for Live at the BBC, and uh, also for the brand-new compilation that's coming out as we speak, the new double CD on air, Live at the BBC Volume 2. And he's also been a documentary producer for the BBC for over 30 years. He's done specials on David Bowie, The Rolling Stones, Lieber and Stoller, and Frank Zappa just to name a few. And uh, what a resume right there to speak of. Kevin Howlett, welcome to Things We Said Today. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, let's start the conversation by uh, talking about the new book. There's so many fascinating things to bring up as far as the Beatles, BBC, radio, and TV appearances. Uh, one of the things that, that I find quite interesting is that the first Beatles, BBC broadcast on radio was for the program Teenager's Turn in uh, March of 1962. This was only a, a few months after Brian Epstein became their manager. And at that point, they still didn't have their record deal with EMI. So I just found it extraordinary that Brian was able so quickly to get them an appearance on BBC Radio. And I also wanted to know, did the BBC give exposure to a lot of um, the unsigned artists at that time, or was this unusual? Well, the, you have to cast your mind back to how it was in England in the, the early 60s from the point of view of listening to the radio. It was so different to American radio. All we had in England in the early 60s was three national radio stations run by the BBC, no competition at all to the BBC, the only one of the three national networks that would play popular music was the light program, and there's the clue, the light program. It was light music. It was uh, light classical pieces and, uh, and crooners and things like that, and occasionally you'd get some beat music, as they called it in those days. And uh, Teenager's Turn, that also says it all, because half an hour a day was devoted to the music of the teenagers. So... Monday to Friday, there was a different show in that strand, Teenager's Turn, and one from Manchester, which is near Liverpool, of course, uh, was called Here We Go, and they would have a local group on with the Northern Dance Orchestra, which is sort of like a Glenn Miller-style uh, dance orchestra that would play popular tunes. And so the producer of that program, Peter Pilbeam, would search the Northwest for new groups to put on his program and there was a lot of talent to choose from you know liverpool had around 300 groups at that time it's very interesting that the beatles passed their audition and you know that was one of their first big successes from the point of view of passing auditions they just failed their decca audition mm -hmm. 
the big three and Billy J. Kramer and Jerry and the Pacemakers all failed their auditions for Teenagers Turn with Peter Pilby, even though they were very popular in the uh, Mersey scene. So in the book, you can now, in a file of replica documents, hold in your hand that original application for an audition by variety department that Brian Epstein filled in, one of the first things he did, really, when he took over the Beatles. And on the back of this audition report that you can now own for yourself are Peter Pilbeam's uh, handwritten comments. And uh, there are some lovely things in there. He makes comments on the vocalists, uh, John Lennon, yes, Paul McCartney, no. And, uh, of course, the great comment about the Beatles and you know, if if you had this in a general knowledge quiz, would you guess that he was talking about the Beatles? He says, not as rocky as most, more country and western, with a tendency to play music. <laughs> so that also sums up the attitude to uh, beat music at the time. You know, it wasn't really viewed as music, but the Beatles had a tendency to be rather musical. <laughs> that, that was, so that it was, was a very the, different radio scene. That was that was something that I was gonna that I was gonna mention, Kevin. Did the BBC ever show any real enthusiasm toward any group? I mean, they 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 were, as you say, they were kind of they were tepid to the Beatles. They, you know, they they were, you know, they uh, the the Lennon yes and the McCartney no comment was was kind of interesting. But yeah, did they ever? Fair, was, I think. Um, sorry, I, to be fair, I think Paul would admit that uh, he, you know he got really nervous at auditions and maybe mm-hmm. he didn't do his best performance. Um, um, but he was allowed to sing on the first broadcast. So, uh, you know, they, they were good enough to do that for him. And, uh, you know, my hat is tipped to the BBC for spotting their talent, their potential, and and they were on very early. And, uh, you know, in their first broadcast, they sing Please, Mr. Postman. It must have been the first time a Motown song was ever heard in Britain because certainly the original Motown and Tamla records were not played in the early 60s on UK radio even though, of course, that was an American number one. But, uh, you know, they, the BBC also were, you know, very wise in giving the Beatles their own radio series in 1963, Pop Go the Beatles, and it's that series that has given us this wonderful treasure trove of songs they never did on record, which, if it had not been for that series, where they had to record six songs every week, and they only had about 18 out on record at the t- by the time the series finished in September, yet they did 56 different songs during that series, you can see that they were very keen to show what a large repertoire they had, playing their favorites by Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Carl Perkins, those sort of rock and roll records that they grew up with as uh, teenagers, but also trying out contemporary material, R&B material, as I say, Motown songs, you know, all the cover versions on With the Beatles which came out in November 63, were played during the summer of 63 on Pop Go the Beatles. Uh, listeners to that show had a preview of, of songs like You Really Got a Hold on Me and Money. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, my, I, again, I tip my hat to the BBC. There were, there were two sides to the BBC story, really, in this era. That there were the kind of very keen maverick sound engineers and young producers who were really into the current music and wanted to give... Uh, the Beatles the best possible sound and the best context for their music. And then there was the rather stuffy old-fashioned management who really probably thought, this is all going to go away in a few weeks, and I hope it goes away rather quickly. You know, they were rather staid and formal, and, you know, they didn't really understand it. But, you know, often in the BBC's history, even if they didn't quite understand popularity of something or why it was popular, they did see a need to bring it to the public. You know, but it's founded on public service, the BBC. It's non-commercial. But, of course, it had huge audiences in those days because there was no competition. So coming back to your original point, Brian Epstein recognized that this would be a significant step forward for the group. Teenager's Turn was heard by at least two million people, hmm. and it was national. And, you know, once they got on Saturday Club, which their first broadcast on Saturday Club was in January 1963, just around the time Please Please Me was issued in this country, then they reached a massive audience, you know, because half an hour of Saturday Club was broadcast on the BBC's general overseas service, so outside the UK. So, that you know, about 20 million people will be listening to uh, at least uh, one or two of the songs during that Saturday Club session. So 
the BBC really played an important part in popularizing the group. You know, absolutely no doubt about that. And the Beatles appeared so many times, especially in 1963, on the radio performing songs at the BBC. And uh, they knew that because the BBC hardly played a record because of restrictions that, due to the musicians' union, that you had to play live. So that you'd, you'd travel hundreds of miles through the night from one end of the country to the other to appear in a BBC studio and then travel hundreds of miles back again to play another gig, you know. And that's the way it was. You had to do that uh, to get known. And that's all part of uh, the breakthrough year in this country in 1963, this country, the UK, I mean. And that paved the way for America. I find it really interesting that the Beatles chose to do... Altogether, there were the 36 songs that they didn't release on EMI. What was the mindset of the group at that time? Because they very easily could have just said, we're here to sell our records and only what we've released. Did they just want to give more to the fans to, through their radio series? Yeah, well, as I say, you know, Pop Go the Beatles, six songs every week, Tuesday evening at 5 o'clock, the Beatles with a guest group and reading out requests from their fans with a, an announcer. They didn't want to repeat themselves, you know. They, yeah, you know, they would have been repeating the songs over and over and over again. And of course, we know that they had a huge repertoire because of playing so many hours in the nightclubs of Hamburg and at the Cavern Club in Liverpool. So, why not bring their listeners these songs that they could do so well? I mean, that's the great thing, you know. I'm, I am so pleased that the two live at the BBC albums bring everybody back to the idea of the Beatles were a great live band because in those early years of the Beatles' success, 1963, 64, uh, you know, they had to perform so well because there wasn't a lot of time to do these sessions at the BBC and they were so busy in the summer of 63 that they, on two occasions, did uh, three programs for Pop, Pop Go the Beatles in one day. So... 16th of July, 1963, 18 songs in less than seven hours. <laughs> 3rd of September, 63, 19 songs in a day at the BBC. And not the tried and trusted familiar ones, you know, unusual ones. Things that, as Ringo uh, put it in, uh, in an interview, you know, we might rehearse a couple of numbers in the lunchtime and do them that afternoon. So incredibly proficient, so good as a live group, and able to learn a song quickly, r arrange it amongst themselves and, and play it. So, and we're so lucky to uh, have all these recordings and, and simply because the BBC were very early in spotting the group's not only great musical potential but the way that they were so good at speaking in front of the microphone. They were so confident so early on and they had such great witty banter amongst themselves and with the announcers who were with them who are really quite different people to what the Beatles were used to you know trained actors who'd been on television or, or in radio soap operas who came out with rather contrived corny links and the Beatles of course sent it all up and had a great time you can hear them giggling in the background as each as one of them reads a request and might stumble over something and you know I when I compiled this new album I particularly wanted to have quite a lot of those sort of speech extracts on the album to conjure up the feeling of what radio was like in those days and how refreshing it was to hear such informality when the Beatles were on the radio. Pop stars were not usually like that um, and they were usually patronized by the people who were presenting the programs and who were all, always about 15 years older and, and may not have been fans of the music particularly. But, uh, you know, they, they, the BBC knew that the, there was such chemistry within that group that they could hold their own and have their own series so early on. So, well done, BBC, for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> were, there, were there other, I mean, there's been several other legitimate BBC collections released by other bands. I'm thinking specifically, because I just picked it up, is that big kink set that, that came out a few months ago that's absolutely wonderful. But were there other groups that you could, that, from your knowledge, did as much stuff uh, or new stuff like like the Beatles, unique stuff like the Beatles did? I don't no, think I. I, think, I, the, I yeah. think the Beatles are unique there. You know, I, I, from the point of view of the number of programs done in such a short space of time, and then the number of previously unreleased songs at that time, uh, the Beatles are the champions in that regard. 
you know, sure, the, the Kinks, um, I haven't seen that sh- set yet, but I, I've, I've gone in the past through the, the Kinks recordings at the BBC, and I'm not sure how many songs are in the BBC sessions that didn't make it onto record. I know the Stones did a few, but mm-hmm. certainly nowhere near 36. Yeah, and Led Zeppelin, for example, did something else when they did a... I mean, the Eddie Cochran song, something else, when they did a BBC session. So groups would experiment a little and do maybe stage favourites that they never put on record, but thought, OK, we'll do them for the BBC. But no, the, the Beatles are the absolute champions of um, doing those sorts of songs, songs that, if it hadn't been for the BBC, would never have been aired and we wouldn't hear now. And, you know, I'm just so grateful that they did them for the BBC and and the BBC recorded them so well. I mean, I, they were done, as I say, very quickly, but they got a great sound. And especially in 63, there was absolutely no chance of any overdubbing or anything like that. It was straight down to mono. There was never a multi-track tape machine in the BBC until the 1970s, but on some of the latest sessions, you can hear that they did overdub a few things by just playing or singing along to a track they'd just recorded, um, adding hand claps or another lead vocal or an instrument. But uh, basically, most of the material that we hear from the Beatles at the BBC is live. And so on the on air live at the BBC Volume 2, you get versions of Beatles songs that you know from their records, but, you, you know, with a different kind of instrumentation. So Money doesn't have the piano on it, and there's no harmonica on I'll Get You. So you, you, do, you do get a different feel, uh, which makes it very valid to hear BBC performances of even the familiar songs, you know, not just the songs that they didn't do on record at the time. Hmm. I love on the new album some of these alternative BBC performances. I mean, I, I saw a standing there. It's just a wonderful, terrific performance. And Twist and Shout, you know, Twist and Shout, Money, I could go on. (laughs) They're they're really, really good. Kevin, uh, you you say in your book that there was only one radio show that the BBC saved of the Beatles. All the recordings that we've heard, whether from bootlegs or the, the two double CDs, live at the BBC and now on air, are the sources for those recordings mainly from fans who taped it off the radio and we're talking i guess in those days reel to reel or were they really from vinyl discs that were sent out to radio stations yeah vinyl discs it, it, that was a good source for the later material from sessions from 64 and and the last one from 65 cuz by the middle of 1964 the bbc realized that british pop music was a, a valuable export and they had this BBC transcription service that would send out culture to the rest of the empire, I think it was set up to do, but uh, they realized pop music was very attractive to other countries, and so they they had a program called Top of the Pops, which has nothing to do with the TV program of the same name that ran here for a long time, which is a bit like um, Dick Clark's American Bandstand, that sort of program. Top of the Pops was a radio program especially for overseas listeners, presented by Brian Matthew, who did Saturday Club and Top Gear mm-hmm. on the UK broadcast. And so they'd showcase British sessions from lots of bands, and, that, and that's how a lot of the BBC session material from the 60s survived, because of those vinyl discs, you know, including the Kinks and the Hollies and Hendrix and all sorts of groups. And uh, so the, the later BBC sessions survive in that way. There were some Pop Go the Beatles songs that survived because, as I understand it, uh, somebody was working in the world service or general overseas service as it was originally named um compiled a a tape of some of the highlights from pop go the beatles when that was a a name of a series broadcast on the on the world service and it compiled songs from that series and other programs the beatles did and i think just for the amusement of his colleagues during the night he'd compiled a, a tape of uh songs that had not been released on record by the beatles and so that yielded quite a few good Pop Go the Beatles performances. And the producers of those programs from the 60s were still around when I started this quest in the early 80s as a very young rookie producer at the National Pop Music Network, Radio 1. Uh, people like Bernie Andrews were still there, and and he had kept tapes. He'd wisely taped 
Saturday clubs and Top Gear programs and things like that. So, yeah, li- you know, producer tapes, that was a source. So, you know, for instance, on the new album, some of Bernie's tape copies you can hear. I saw her standing there, I'll get you um, things we said today. <laughs> and, um, mm. uh, you know, that sort of era. So, yeah, and um, you can hear that... Uh, when I do, when I've done radio programs about this material in the past, listeners have got in touch and said, uh, "Yeah, we take songs off uh, the radio when we were teenagers, and I've got a tape up in the attic. I'll dig it out." And you know, that's how a song like um, "Keep Your Hands Off My Baby" or on the new one, "Beautiful Dreamer," came to me because a listener got in touch actually during the broadcast of the Beebs or Beatles tapes in 1988. So they, they come from all sources, but uh, you know, the standard of the sound is extremely good, and uh, you'll be, uh, I think, very pleased to hear the remastered sound of the 1994 album, too. It's, um, it's a big improvement, just because we have so much more sophisticated software to work with now. Uh, and also, uh, we found better sources in some cases, too. So, you, did uh, find yeah. some be- you did find some better sources for the 94 stuff? Yeah, yeah. Um, you'll notice some subtle differences. Um, for example, uh, things we said today on the original album is taken from a vinyl disc with Brian Matthew doing a voiceover, the introduction. You'll hear on the remastered version that, that uh, things we said today no longer has that voiceover because uh, we use a tape from a domestic broadcast. It's one of Bernie Andrews' tapes, actually. Hmm. So, uh, that's a good, very good quality and different source so you know there's, there's examples like that but uh yeah the, the you know i'm really pleased that uh, the album does focus everybody back to that exciting era of 63 64 but uh the book of course goes right the way through to april 1970 when just even a few days before that uh george harrison is doing an interview at the bbc and uh it seems from what he's saying and this was broadcast on easter monday in 1970 that there's every chance the Beatles are going to still make an album after they've all done their solo projects. So, you know, you do hear about uh, the very, very busy BBC session years of 63, 64, but throughout the book you get transcripts of interviews, uh, often individual interviews, which really sum up what was going on in the Beatles' world after they were performing live at the BBC. And there really are some fascinating interviews and documents that I found in the written archives because the BBC were great at keeping paperwork, if not the tapes. Um, so mm. you can see in the book fantastic memos and telegrams and contracts and correspondence between the BBC and Brian Epstein and all sorts of revelations uh, come to you through these documents. Um, and that's been such a thrill because going through these files, uh, dusty old files in the BBC written archives, it's so thrilling to, for example, come across a uh, piece of paper which has been typed by John Lennon and signed by John Lennon and has a handwritten note on the bottom from John Lennon. And you can now own a replica of, of that document. And uh, that was about a TV interview he did in 1968. And John has typed, why have you cut the only bit of real communication out of my release interview? Love, John Lennon, then his signature. And then he's written, or so I've heard. Uh, he got, It's one of his first overt political statements when he really does look into the camera and say to viewers out there, it was an arts program called Release, and he was being interviewed about the National Theatre production of his, based on his two books. And mm. he, uh, he looks at the camera and says, yeah, you are being run by insane people for insane objectives. And uh, he thought that had been cut, which is why he typed the note. But the producer wrote back immediately and saying, no, no, it's, it's in. And of course... That, that bit of film footage survives. But uh, in the written archive, I found the complete transcript of the interview, including the bits that don't survive on film, so you can read the whole thing. Hmm. So, you know, things like that in the book, um, you know, to me, very exciting to present to everybody because uh, they, they do reveal things that are new, which is terrific, you know, all sorts of examples of that throughout the book. I'm curious to find out, of all the uh, BBC TV appearances from the Beatles, group and solo, how much was actually saved? Yeah, not a great deal uh, of the musical performances, anyway. Um, 
the Mersey Sound program was saved, uh, which was a very important documentary which the BBC made about the phenomenon of groups coming from Liverpool, the Mersey uh, side of sound. And, of course, those famous interviews with the Beatles at the end of that uh, program we've seen in, in the anthology when uh, Ringo famously says he'd like to own a string of hairdressing salons. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, Paul says, I, I think probably what we'll do is write songs. Um, because they were always being asked, you know, what, what are you going to do when it's all over? And that, that even in that program, they were addressing that question, you know, what, what, what will you do when all this blows away, which everybody expected would be in a few months' time. So that was kept. And some of an incredibly live and wild concert for a program called It's the Beatles, some of that footage survives. And it's fantastic to see, actually. I mean, that, that uh, concert, which was broadcast on the 7th of December 1963, really represents the, the peak of British Beatlemania, in my opinion, uh, because also they were on earlier in the evening as all four panel members of Jukebox Jury, which was a hugely successful show on BBC television. So they had two shows on that evening. They really dominated the Saturday evening schedule, and... You know, if you didn't like the Beatles, there was only one other channel to tune to in, in the UK, and, and that was independent television. Yeah, so this is a country at the time with just two television channels. Hmm. But, um, so, yeah, huge audience again. Steve? I found one interesting fact as I was going through the book, Kevin. Um, the the uh, Shea Stadium film was mm -hmm. watched by fewer people than the TV show Amos Burke, secret agent, which was known in America as Burke's Law, that oh, that floored me. <laughs> that absolutely floored me. Uh, that uh, that that the uh, BBC memo mentioned that. Um, do, do you have any idea why? Yeah, that that's from an audience research report, and it, all of the audience research reports hammer home that message that you know they weren't universally adored by everybody in the country. You know, uh, there was still a dividing line, uh, and it was really based on age, whether you were appreciative of the Beatles or not. And, and uh, if you hadn't been a teenager when rock and roll happened, in my opinion, you, you struggled to find the new music something that you would like. And so in the audience research reports, there are, you know, they, they divide people up demographically, and, and they see people who are 20 or over as quite old and, and would not really like this kind of music. So... Again, in, in the file of documents, there's an audience research report for a program called From Us to You. And uh, just looking at um, that document now, there's, there's, there's a lovely comment from a solicitor who describes himself as definitely over 20, but says, how could anyone fail to like them? Their music is so gay and uninhibited, and they themselves are full of joie de vivre. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, it's, some of the other kind of older people who didn't really like this sort of music, um, described the Beatles as vastly overrated. That was a security guard. And um, somebody listened out of curiosity, but failed to see any reason for the Beatles' popularity. Vastly overrated. It's, you know, it's, it's funny because... <laughs> it's funny because, uh, I mean, that's exactly what happened in America, too. Um, mm -hmm. There was, a, in, in 64 especially, there were a lot of adults that that did not like pop music. I mean, I've I've said before that um, you know the night Ed Sullivan was on and we were all sitting there watching TV. My dad was sitting in the background complaining about their hair, and then mm. come four months later when the Rolling Stones came down the line, he liked the Beatles all of a sudden. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, I mean there was a lot. There were a lot of adults that that didn't you know that didn't understand or didn't appreciate the, the pop music in general. And the I think that's an important point as well to make, is that uh, people from this distance may not realize, especially if you weren't around at the time, that uh, this was all incredibly revolutionary, revolutionary and radical. And certainly I, I, I know that the Beatles were kind of surprised when they arrived in America, which they'd always revered as the hippest place to be, to find people with crew-cut haircuts and rather uncool clothes and and they arrived in their kind of very chic fashionable suits and you know 
tab collar shirts and knitted ties and and longish hair. Um, but I mean, we don't think it's particularly long now. But boy, was it viewed as long in those days. Hmm. So they were representing something very radical. And you know, the cover of with the Beatles, the British LP, Meet the Beatles in America. That moody half shadow shot of the four of them not smiling. I mean, it just it just was so different to the normal kind of pop sleeve, pop LP sleeve. So everything was really radical, and it, it's important to make the point that you should view this as a defining moment. You know, it, it, they were changing the game, and listening to the album and what they're doing in the speech links with, with the presenters, that's changing the game too. The music they're playing, so raucous. Remember, in the context of the BBC Light programme, they might be on a program where there's some trad jazz and somebody crooning a kind of Frank Sinatra-type song, and then you hear the Beatles do Money. I mean, completely out there, you know, wild performance. And, uh, you know, so it was viewed as shocking. And this was all the way down the line, I think, through the 60s. Um, in the book, there's quite a lot of material about the Our World broadcast of All You Need Is Love, which was a really important TV program linking up five continents, the first time that satellite television was doing this. Television by satellite could link these countries together, and each country chose something to represent their nation. And the Beatles were chosen to represent the UK. And uh, again, well done BBC for choosing the Beatles to represent the UK. But that wonderful performance in Abbey Road with the flowers and the beautiful people around them was not viewed by all of the TV viewing audience as a good thing to represent Britain. If you read the audience research report of our world, you get phrases like, we did not do ourselves justice. What a dreadful impression they must have given the rest of the world. I hope they do not think this is typical. <laughs> After all the culture, etc., shown by the other countries, the Beatles were the absolute dregs. Love, love the English word there. And then in brackets, incidentally, I am a Beatles fan. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I love that. It just gives you the context of the time. You know, it's, it's very easy to look back in a kind of a revisionist way and imagine that everybody in Britain thought having the Beatles on our world representing the UK was just completely the right thing to do. But, nope, <laughs> a lot of people disapproved. Kevin, I have to thank you for uh, a number of things. First of all, I love all the transcriptions of the interviews that are in your book. I found all of them to be fascinating. I was very familiar with the David Wig interviews because I've had the album of those interviews, and uh, which also came out on CD. But um, also finding out about all the different uh, TV specials was a real treat for me. Finding out about the Beatles Abroad, which I didn't know all that much about. Uh, the Lennon-McCartney songbook I had heard about, but you just mentioned release uh, those programs. Also the, um, the John and Yoko special, 24 Hours, The World Of. Um, of all these shows, first of all, what would you find to be the most fascinating of all those programs? And since I already brought this up before, one thing that I, I sh maybe I shouldn't find shocking is that certainly in 1962 and 63, nobody knew at the time that the Beatles were going to become the worldwide phenomena that they became. But once it was 1964 and the Beatles exploded all over the world, why didn't the BBC uh, you know, care enough to save everything at that point? Whether we're talking about radio or television, they must have seen, hey, look what they're doing in America and, and all the other countries. There must be some value with what we've got here. Yeah, you would imagine so, wouldn't you? But... Uh... It was expensive to not reuse videotape. In the BBC's defense to do with radio, uh, I think there was a musician's union regulation that you had to destroy a taped performance because if you kept repeating tapes, it would put musicians out of work. So I think there was they were actually required by a contract to do that. And that's why... Certain producers kept their own copies because they, they realized that these things had value. But uh, as I said before, there is this di division in the BBC between the people at the 
the sharp end, if you like, the producers and sound engineers who are really into this, and then the management hierarchy who really don't understand it. And there are various examples of that in the book. I mean, you mentioned The Beatles Abroad, which is a terrific listen because Brian Matthew, who else? <laughs> he's hmm. worked with them more than anybody. He's on tour for a few days with them, and he's at Shea Stadium, and he, and he interviews them in the hotel rooms. You can hear George strumming his guitar as he talks to Brian. And uh, it's, you know, really fascinating to hear what it was like on tour, and there's very good access to the Beatles. Now, that was broadcast on a August Bank holiday Monday in all of the UK apart from Scotland, which had different public holidays. So they had their usual programs and not the special bank holiday programs. Because whenever we have a bank holiday Monday here, we always put out a different schedule to celebrate the holiday. So there was a plan to repeat the program so, so that listeners in Scotland could enjoy this really good program, which had all these interviews with the Beatles on their very ground, very much a groundbreaking tour. But uh, in the book, you'll see uh, some correspondence about that, which is very revealing uh, about the way that certain members of the BBC management viewed the Beatles, even in 1965. And uh, I'm just flicking through the wonderful glossy pages of the book now so that I can <laughs> quote from this, uh, this high-up BBC official who um, responds to um, a question, you know, should we repeat this program so that viewers in Scotland can hear the program? And uh, the phrase that is, is used is, um, better to let sleeping dogs lie. Meaning, you know, no, don't bother. No. No, it's, it's, it, we, we put it out. And uh, somebody makes a comment on this memo saying, you know, I, I wonder if, because it had been sent, a copy had been sent to the producer of the program, Jimmy Grant, and uh, somebody had made a comment, you know, uh, I wonder if they would be as disrespectful of any other kind of program when sending a copy to the producer. In other words, popular music was really still regarded as something rather lowbrow and really not something maybe the BBC, BBC should be doing. So you, you, you had to fight against that sort of an attitude on mm. the one hand, but on the other hand, they would respond to somebody's idea of giving the Beatles their own radio series, and just within a couple of weeks it was on the air. So two sides to the BBC there. Um, Kevin, let me ask a question about the book specifically. When did you decide to, because to, you've done, as, 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 Ken read at the, or as Ken said at the beginning of the show, you've done books on the, on the Beatles BBC radio shows before. When did you decide to add the TV output to it and was the book decided before the CDs or after or what how did that how did that work yeah the, the first Beatles at the Bead book I did was very quickly after that first radio special I did in 1982 and uh, our knowledge of Beatles BBC material was fairly limited and I and I ended it in 1965 when they did their last session for the BBC so that was a program really based on the content of that original special and just 62 to 65. I was asked to do another book after the success of the 1994 album, and so I thought I would continue the story right through to 1970 and, and um, talk about some of the other radio programs they did, even though they weren't performing songs on them. And uh, then the idea came up to do this book, and I said, well, you know, I'd like to rewrite it completely and include television this time, and I kept also stressing the importance of having really good photographs of the unique documents from the BBC archive. I thought that was a really important element of the book, so that I could share the excitement that I felt when I looked at these documents with a readership. I, I felt sure that people would be fascinated to see these documents. So that um, that idea was um, accepted. And it's interesting because the work on the new album, Live at the BBC Volume 2, a lot of it was done in 2011. And 
the idea for the book was brought up in 2012, but of course I couldn't say <laughs> that uh, it's quite likely that there's going to be a, a follow-up to the 1994 album because that sort of thing has to be kept top secret. So it came as a very welcome surprise to the publisher when I could finally reveal that it was going to be an album, you know, because they actually did commission the book without knowing that. So uh, to then have the album and the book coming out at the same time is very good, uh, obviously, because it's, you know, if, you, if you're interested in the album and you want to dig deeper, then the book is a very, very good companion to it. And, uh, you know, to use a BBC phrase from the 60s, you know, you could have a lovely bumper bundle of the remastered album volume two and the book and then you've really got it all sewn up from uh, the BBC Beatles archive really <laughs> hmm. uh, it was the I mean we all know what the uh, and it's outlined in the book the uh, the reaction after the fact to uh, Magical Mystery Tour did the BBC have any idea what they were getting I mean did they know were they expecting the reaction that they got I think the BBC didn't really know what they were going to get. Um, they didn't really commission the, that film until quite late on. I, I mean, the, the Beatles went off and made it independently and didn't really know whether it would go to BBC or ITV, I believe. And that, but by this stage, there's three TV channels because the BBC has a second channel, BBC Two. But hardly anybody can watch that because you needed a special TV aerial to get your set to receive it. And uh, BBC Two broadcast in colour, but hardly anybody had a colour television set in Britain in 1967. But the Beatles were making their film in lovely colour, of course. So the deal was done between Paul McCartney and the head of BBC One television, Paul Fox. Very ad hoc, you know, it, it, it was done in... The, Paul Fox's office at the BBC, and um, he, he, I think he signed this deal without having seen the film. Um, and so he trusted them and thought, well, you know, Boxing Day, which is a important holiday in Britain, the day after Christmas Day, um, I'll have a Beatles film. How wonderful. And lots of people will want to watch it. And of course, lots of people did watch it, but didn't get what they expected. And uh, that's part of the problem really from the point of view of uh, the film being criticized is uh, it was in a slot where people were expecting one thing and they got something very different they got a, an experimental fantasy film and they were expecting a showbiz extravaganza and uh, you know that's you know it still was a big audience but I remember watching it at the time I was 10 years old and I remember the controversy following it we all saw it in black and white, of course, so it was quite confusing in black and white, some of the sequences. But yes, that audience research report is in the file of documents that comes in the box with the book. And uh, yeah, <laughs> people really didn't like it. Uh, the biggest waste of public money since the ground nut scheme, someone says. <laughs> Remember, the BBC is publicly funded by a license fee that people have to pay in order to receive TV and radio. Positively, the worst program I can remember seeing on any TV channel. A load of rubbish. <laughs> We've made better home movies ourselves. But, you know, there were a few positive comments. Um, a a schoolboy in the audience research report says it was one of the best Christmas programs we've had for a long time. Mm. The idea was clever as well as original. It was very funny in parts. A marvelous program in black and white. In color, it would be indescribable. Mm. So a few people liked it. Um, and, you know, obviously, just seeing them do those great songs, whether you completely understood the linking bits or not, you know, you were still going to really enjoy seeing them doing I Am The Walrus or Your Mother Should Know or, you know, you name them. You know, on the same subject here, um, one of the interesting quotes from all the interviews uh, is one that John gave to David Wigg. And it's kind of related to what, what we were just talking about, and in this, this entire discussion, talking about how Britain was very tough and critical of the Beatles. Mm 
And John was actually uh, referencing what George Harrison had said about that. And he said, and I'm going to quote him here, The Beatles are treated like Britain's children. George gets very depressed. It's depressing when the whole family is picking on you. We do get hurt because Britain appreciates us least. Now, those last few words are pretty powerful. Their own, you know, home country. Do you think that, that, um, I mean, you observed it. Do you feel Britain was way yeah, too harsh on the Beatles? Yeah, I feeling about that. Um, you know, 1969, they had great commercial success in this country. But um, particularly that year, I think people wonder what was going on. And again, that, um, that age division, you had to be a certain age to appreciate what John and Yoko were doing, for example, in that year. And certainly those interviews in 1969, it's all centered around, are you going to stay together or not? So, yeah, 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 I know exactly what John meant when he said that, um, because, you know, I, I have observed myself that, for example, America seems to be much more in love with the Beatles continually um, from, you know, they change your lives in 1964 and, and you, you know, everyone in America still loves the Beatles. And uh, in this country, they've kind of gone in and out of fashion a bit. Uh, there was a thing in around punk new wave time, late 70s in this country, when you know the idea was to throw out all the, uh, the previous groups. The Clash sang, you know, No More Beatles or Rolling Stones in 1977. Of course, you, you talk to the members of the Clash, and they all loved the Beatles, uh, hmm. really. <laughs> but you couldn't, ex- you couldn't admit it during punk time. You know, Glenn Matlock apparently was thrown out of the Sex Pistols because he did like the Beatles. But you talk to John Lydon now, and he'll admit that he loved the Beatles. It's funny. I don't, I don't know if you agree with that, but I, I, I think America's love affair with the Beatles has gone on and on and on. And uh, and it, over here, it's it's been a bit up and down. I think now, though, every young band has to acknowledge that the, if they're serious about music, they need to listen to the Beatles, and uh, they know that the world that they're operating in would not be as it is if it hadn't been for the Beatles. But, uh, yeah, definitely in 1969, you know, people were looking to knock the Beatles off their pedestal, maybe. And I think the Beatles themselves may even have felt insecure about their position at times, you know. They never felt they could rest on their laurels. Uh, there's an, uh, another interview where John says, you know, people think just because it's got the name Beatles on it, it'll sell. But no, you know, we always have to do something that's going to be great. And uh, so they never, ever coasted. You know, I mean that's the thing about the Beatles. You know, never do what you did before, and you know, lead from the front, and everybody tries to catch up. You know, they're just way ahead of everybody else. You know, um, I remember talking to Tom Petty for a series I did a few years ago that was broadcast in America too, as well as here. It was called The Beatles Here, There, and Everywhere, and I interviewed various people about the Beatles. And Tom Petty summed it up. He said, you know, there was the Beatles, and then there was everyone else. I think it was always like that, you know. They, they, all, they were always setting the standard, and you had to try and catch up. And if you felt you were catching up, then the Beatles had gone ahead of you again. So that was the whole part of it, really. And that's why, you know, nobody will ever uh, equal what they did in terms of changing music and changing the game every time they released a record. That's right. Just a few last things. Since we mentioned his name quite a lot, and rightfully so, Brian Matthew, this is someone who hosted more shows with the Beatles than anybody else on BBC Radio. Was it just a matter of luck that he was the host of Saturday Club and Easy Beat, or was it just also the sense that there was a, a great rapport that he had with the group? Yeah, he was one of just a handful of DJs. I mean, I even hesitate to call them DJs at that time because they didn't even spin their own records. Um, the records were played for them. Mind you, I think that was true of some American top 40 radio stations in New York, for example. But, um, yeah, Brian Matthew, there was Brian Matthew, Alan Freeman, who also talked to the Beatles on a couple of shows. It was, it was a great, legendary DJ here. Hmm. Pete Murray and David Jacobs and Jack Jackson, and, and that was all. That was the case for the 50s and, and the 60s until pirate radio came along in this country. 
And that really revolutionized everything because we had American-style radio being broadcast from ships around the coast of Britain playing pop records all day. That seriously threatened the, the BBC's audiences, giving the people what they wanted. But Brian, you know, when you listen to the pop profile interviews on Live at the BBC Volume 2, and you can read transcripts of those pop profile interviews in the 1965 and 1966 chapters in the book, you can see that they were at ease with Brian, and he would ask them questions which were really out of the ordinary way of talking to pop stars. He treated them seriously, and he talked about their personal lives. And he was not in awe of them, that's for sure. And uh, so you get some very revealing answers. Very different to the kind of banter that went on on Saturday Club when Brian was talking to them, where everything was done for a laugh and there was a lot of joking about. And Brian seemed to sort of take the role of teacher and they were unruly pupils and um you know come on have you done get on with it all that kind of thing was going on from brian but you know he toured with them you know he 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 understood what it was like to be in that bubble on tour in america and yeah they were fond of him definitely and uh he he did a great job you know and his his voice was so redolent of the time hearing his booming voice coming out of a radiogram, a lovely big wooden radiogram that people used to have in those days, which gave it that lovely warm resonance. And the light program was broadcast on long wave, which gave it an even deeper bassy sound, no, not a lot of top on long wave. So I just remember as a kid, you know, Brian's boomy, warm, friendly voice coming out of the radiogram or your transistor radio, you know, very much of the time. And he's still broadcasting on uh, BBC Radio 2 in this country in his mid-80s, presenting a program called Sounds of the 60s, which is a hugely popular program. I was, gonna, I was just going to mention. I was just going to mention that because uh, I've heard the show, and it's a great, it's a, it's a fantastic show. And yeah. I, I don't think a, a lot of American uh, listeners will know that he is still at work, and he still sounds yeah. great. I mean, he still sounds. That voice is great, and uh, the show is really unusual in its mix of music. It's certainly not the, all the obvious things from the 60s. It's a lovely musical mix, and uh, it's extremely popular. You know, it gets, you know, I don't know, 4 million, 5 million listeners between 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock in the morning on the most popular network in the country, BBC Radio 2, our pop, pop music network for people over 35. And, uh, you know... So, Brian, yeah, long may he continue. And, Kevin, uh, do you know, um, and uh, I, I apologize if if, um, if this isn't something you know about, but I understand that the BBC is going to start making downloads available of their shows next year. Do you know anything about that? There is, I think, a scheme where certain pop documentaries might be available, I don't know, for downloading, but for streaming from, from the archives. No, I th no. This is supposedly for downloading because there was a a program that you could download shows with, and the BBC apparently stopped them from doing that with the provision that they were going to start allowing downloads next year, full downloads rather than streaming. They've been doing streaming for a while. But, yeah, yeah uh, we've been doing streaming for ten years at least. But um, I, I would have thought the copyright situation would make it tricky for people to download, for example, a music documentary. Okay. Because podcasts normally, uh, you're restricted to 30 seconds of clear music. Right. Uh, so unless they re-edit these things, um, I think you'd run into problems there. But Okay. Um, Maybe that isn't true then. To make, to make programs from the archive available is a good idea. There's a program in, that's been running for... Uh, 70 years in this country called Desert Island Discs where people mm -hmm. mm. choose their eight favorite records that they would wish to be marooned on a desert island with. Right. And recently they've made hundreds of programs from that archive available for download. But mm -hmm. Paul McCartney was on is, that. That's right. Yeah, he was. And uh, so was Brian Epstein, actually. Mm -hmm. But the music was has been uh, shortened. So those programs aren't as they were broadcast although they would never play a record all the way through anyway on Desert mm -hmm. Island Discs because it was a 45-minute show. Mm 
but even so, the download versions, the music has been truncated, so because mm. that's for copyright reasons. So unless they can circumvent that copyright law, you wouldn't get a, a full hour music documentary with the music as it was played. Okay. But you know, I, I don't know. I don't know about that. Maybe they found some way of allowing that. Well, let's hope. I'm going to cross my fingers. All right, Kevin, we, we have to wrap things up. I thought we'd close with, since we're talking about BBC specials, um, you have your own radio special that's been prepared for the new CD. Um, why don't you tell us more about that? And I've heard that you've done a new interview with Paul McCartney. Yeah, there is a radio special that will be broadcast. I think it's going to come out in the States around the Thanksgiving weekend. And uh, I've been fortunate to have produced quite a few specials on recent Beatles projects and solo projects uh, over the last 10, 12 years, probably. And this one is called The Beatles On Air, live at the BBC. And uh, you will hear mainly Paul, because I interviewed Paul recently in July. And you'll hear some Archive George and some Ringo, all three talking about their time performing at the BBC. So it's just the three of them and the music and some of the speech from the programs. So, yes, it's a very good introduction to what this is all about and uh, concentrating on those session years, those peak session years, 1963 and 64, from which the two albums are mainly compiled. So, uh, yeah, look out for that Thanksgiving weekend on all sorts of radio stations and formats, I believe. Hmm. Okay, so we're looking forward to that. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us for things we said today. And uh, we wish you much success with this book. I highly recommend it to everyone who's listening to this program right now. It's just wonderful. I'll, I'll second that vote. You know, everything you wanted to know about the Beatles at the Beeb, <laughs> radio and TV is right here in this book. So, Kevin, thanks so well, much thank for joining much, us. Thank uh, you very much for allowing me all this time. And uh, it's been a great pleasure. And uh, good luck with the show. Thank you. All right. What a great guest right there. Kevin Howlett, author of the new book, The Beatles, The BBC Archives. I'm Ken Michaels for Things We Said Today, thanking everyone for listening. And I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying thank you again to Kevin Howlett. And uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>